Hello, and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. A link to the Praying with Teresa of Avila website has been provided below to enable you to find the catalog of offerings on this channel and the notes of today's presentation. The Six Dwelling Places, Chapter 7, A Summary, Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila discusses the kind of suffering uh, those souls to whom God grants the favors mentioned feel concerning their sins, tells what a great mistake it is, however spiritual one may be, not to practice keeping the humanity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ present in one's mind. Also his most sacred passion in life, his glorious mother, and the saints. This chapter is very helpful. You might think, sisters, that uh, these souls to whom the Lord communicates himself in this unusual way will be so sure of enjoying him forever that they will have nothing to fear or sins to weep over. To think this would be a great mistake because suffering over one's sins increases the the more one receives from God. And until we are where nothing can cause pain, this suffering will not be taken away. The soul doesn't think about the suffering it will undergo on account of its sins, but of how ungrateful it has been to one to whom it owes so much and who deserves so much to be served. For in these grandeurs, God communicates to it. The soul understands much more about him, and it weeps over its lack of respect. The favors it has received are like the waves of a large river. They come and go. But the memory these souls have of their sins clings like thick mire, and this is a heavy cross. As for fear of hell, such persons don't have any. That they might lose God at times, though seldom, distresses them very much. All their fear is that God might allow them out of his hand to offend him. In regard to their own suffering or glory, they don't care. If they don't want to stay long in purgatory, the reason comes for the fact of their not wanting to be away from God as are those who are in purgatory rather than from the sufferings undergone there. It's not safe for a soul to forget its past miserable state. Although recalling this misery is a painful thing, doing so is helpful for many. As long as we live in this mortal body, there will always be failures. No relief comes either by recalling that our Lord has already pardoned and forgotten the sins. Rather, it adds to the suffering to realize that favors are granted to one who deserves nothing but hell. I think such a realization was a great martyrdom for St. Peter and the Magdalene. Their love for God had grown so deep that they had received so many favors that the remem remembrance of their misery would have been very difficult to suffer. It may seem that anyone who enjoys such lofty things will no lo longer meditate on the mysteries of the most so sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Such a person would now be engaged entirely in loving and that when souls have passed beyond the beginning stages, it is better they deal with things concerning the divinity and flee from corporeal things. Nonetheless, they will not make me admit such a road is a good one. The devil has already tried to deceive me in this matter. Thus I have learned my lesson from experience. Let me caution you to proceed very carefully in this matter. It will also seem to some souls that they cannot think about the Passion or still less about the Virgin Mary and the lives of the saints. I cannot imagine what such souls are thinking of. 
To be always withdrawn from corporeal things and enkindled in love is the trait of angelic spirits, not of those who live in mortal bodies. It is not necessary to withdraw through one's own efforts from all our good and help which is the most sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those that do withdraw themselves will do harm to themselves and others and will not enter these last two dwelling places. For if they lose the guide, who is the good Jesus, they will not hit upon the right road. The Lord himself says that he is the way, the light, and that no one can go to the Father but through him. And anyone who sees me sees my Father. There are some souls who brought by our Lord to perfect contemplation would like to be in that prayer always, but that is impossible. Yet this favor remains with them afterwards. They cannot engage as before in discursive thought about the mysteries of the passion and the life of Christ. I don't know the reason, but this inability is very common. The intellect becomes less capable of meditation. Perhaps the reason is that since in meditation the whole effort consists in seeking God, and once God is found, the soul becomes used to seeking Him again through the work of the will. The soul doesn't want to tire itself by working with the intellect. Since this generous faculty, the will, is already enkindled, it wants to avoid using the intellect, but this is impossible, especially before the soul reaches the last two dwelling places, because the will often needs the help of the intellect to become enkindled. The Lord wants to be completely occupied, the soul wants to be completely occupied in love, but to be so occupied is impossible. Though the will is not dead, the fire that usually makes it burn is dying out. Someone must blow on the fire so that the heat will be given off. Would it be good for a soul with this dryness? to wait for fire from heaven to burn the sacrifice it is making of itself? No, nor is it right to expect miracles. His Majesty wants us to consider ourselves undeserving of them because of our wretchedness and desires that we help ourselves in every way possible. Anyone the Lord places in the seventh dwelling place rarely needs to make this effort. Such a person walks continually in an admirable way with Christ our Lord, in whom divine and human joined, and who is always that person's companion. As for the above, when the fire in the will is not enkindled, and God's presence is not felt, we must seek his presence. At the beginning of the life of prayer, it may be that the Lord will not give this fire in a year or even in many years. Since we know the path by which we must please God, that of the commandments and the counsels, we should follow it very diligently and think of his life and death and of the many things we owe him. Let the rest come when the Lord desires. Someone may respond that he cannot dwell on these things. Perhaps he will, in a certain way, be right. You already know that discursive thinking with the intellect is one thing, and representing truths to the intellect by means of the memory is another. By meditation, I mean much discursive reflection with the intellect in the following way. We begin to think about the favor God granted us in giving us his only son, and we do not stop there, but we go on to the mysteries of his whole glorious life, or we begin to think about the prayer in the garden, but the intellect doesn't stop 
until he is on the cross. This kind of reflection is an admirable and very meritorious prayer. This prayer, discursive reflection, is the kind that those whom God has brought to supernatural things and to perfect contemplation are right in saying they cannot practice. But I say that a person will not be right if he does not dwell on these mysteries, especially when the Catholic Church celebrates them. Nor is it possible for the soul to forget that it has received so much from God, so many precious signs of love, living sparks, that will enkindle it more in this love for our Lord. But I say this person doesn't understand himself because the soul understands these mysteries in a more perfect manner. The intellect represents them in such a way, and they are so stamped on the memory, that the mere sight of the Lord fallen to the ground in the garden is enough to last the intellect not only an hour, but many days. Soon the will responds with the desire to serve somehow for such a great favor and to suffer something for one who suffered so much. I believe that for this reason, a person cannot go on to further discursive reflection on the passion, and this inability makes him think that he cannot think about it. If he doesn't dwell on these mysteries, it's good that he strives to do so, for doing so will not impede sublime prayer. If the Lord suspends the intellect, well and good. It is a very great help toward every good. The hindrance would come from a great deal of work with the discursive re reflection. One who has advanced further along cannot practice this discursive reflection. It could be that one can, for God leads souls by many paths. But let not those who can travel by this the road of discursive thought condemn those who cannot or judge them incapable of enjoying the sublime, sublime blessing that lie enclosed in the mysteries of our good Jesus Christ. Nor will anyone make me think that he will advance by turning away from these mysteries. There are principles certain souls use by which it is thought that when a person begins to experience the prayer of quiet and spiritual delights given by the Lord, that it is important to remain always in that state of delight. Life is long, and there are many trials. We need to look at Christ as our model, so as to bear these trials with perfection. Jesus is too good a companion to turn away from him and his most blessed mother. Enjoyment in prayer is not so habitual that there is not time for everything. I would be suspicious of anyone who says this delight is continual. And if this absor absorption continues, it is extremely dangerous, at least for the brain and the head. It is fitting for souls, however, spiritual, to take care not to flee from corporeal things to the point of thinking that even the most sacred humanity causes harm. Some quote what the Lord said to his disciples that it was fitting that he go I can't bear this. I would wager that he didn't say this to his most blessed mother, who was firm in faith, and she loved him with such perfection that his presence was a help rather than a hindrance. The apostles must have been as firm, mustn't have been as firm in the faith as they were afterward. I tell you, daughters, I consider this a dangerous path and think the devil could make one lose devotion for the most blessed sacrament. The mistake I was making consisted of not delighting so much in 
the thought of our Lord Jesus Christ, but in going along in that absorption, waiting for the enjoyment. Since it wasn't possible for me to always experience the absorption, the mind wandered here and there. My soul was losing a lot of time and not making progress in virtue or improving in prayer. I didn't understand the reason until a servant of God warned me. I then saw clearly how wrong I had been. I could only gain through him from whom all blessings come to us. May he always be praised. Amen.